Hello, my name is Professor, my name is Chris Hale. I'm a professor of special education at the College of Staten Island, which stands on the original site of Willowbrook State School. I would like to welcome students, faculty and staff, members of the disability advocacy community and all others to the 28th annual Memorial Willowbrook Lecture. We have memorialized the horrors that took place at Willowbrook and the events that led to its closing yearly since 1993, when this lecture was envisioned and established by Professor David Good. Throughout these many years, we have sought to maintain in the collective mind the memory of Willowbrook and to honor its victims and survivors. This evening's event will continue that tradition. Tonight, this event will be recorded and the link will be made available along with a list of advocacy resources. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the support of Robert Wallace, Vice President of Economic Development and Nora Santiago, Urban Policy Analyst, as well as William Fritz, President of the College of Staten Island. Please welcome President Fritz. Thank you very much and good evening. I can't believe it. I, my counter is up to 382 and counting. I think that's a, a, a tremendous turnout for tonight's event. And my role is to just thank all of the organizers and all of the attendees tonight. You know, the College of Staten Island doesn't own the Willowbrook story. The Willowbrook story is owned by you know, so many people of the, the residents of Staten Island, you know, the former residents and family. Uh, but we feel like we play an important role as the custodians of what was the site of Willowbrook State School. And one of the things that I have tried to bring to the college is to recognize the, the solemn, really, uh, importance of being the uh, uh, the, the custodians of, of that story. And, you know, we, we support it in a number of ways. We support it in, and if you look at the profile of our students, we have, you know, uh, many students with developmental disabilities, um, more than any of the other uh, CUNY campuses. And we really support those students and, and offer them uh, support in pursuing their degrees. We participate in the Melissa Riggio program in providing as much of a college experience as we can uh, to uh, in individuals uh, with developmental uh, uh, disabilities. Uh, we support it through our academic programs, uh, many of, uh, of which have a flavor of disability, care for people with disabilities or disability studies in, in a way that makes us uh, a leader in the nation uh, in a number of fields. Uh, we support it through our initiative, the Willowbrook Mile, which is a way to keep the Willowbrook story alive and, and provide a meaningful experience for people to, uh, you know, walk around uh, our campus and, and our uh, neighbor's uh, campus on, on uh, you know, the other side of the fence, which is really a part of the same uh, institution to, to, to remember the story. I think it's critical that we remember the Willowbrook story because only by remembering the story can we see that we don't return as a nation to warehousing uh, people that uh, are different or that, or that somebody in their judgment has, has said is different. And, and it's, it's critical that we keep the, the story alive. We do it through the honors and recognitions that, that we give to uh, individuals that have played uh, uh, you know, significant roles in the Willowbrook story. And of course, we do it by hosting events like this, uh, you know, especially our uh, annual Willowbrook lecture, which has become uh, you know, one of the signature programs at the camp. So my job is to say thank you Thank you to the organizers. It takes a lot of work to, to put on an event with as many participants as we have. And thank you to all of the participants who have taken time from your busy schedules to join us in this important conversation for tonight.
Thank you, President Fritz. Tonight is a realization of months of organization and years of anticipation. We have two purposes this evening. One is memorial. We will hear the voices of the brave parents of individuals who lived in Willowbrook, who saw the injustices there, who worked together to, to close it down. To that end, we will view interviews with these parents. It is vitally important that we hear their voices. We will also hear from the two doctors who supported these parents in their activism. The second purpose of this evening is to inspire advocacy and activism today. While Willowbrook, while Willowbrook and other institutions like it have long since closed, the situation today for people with disabilities who depend on the government has reached a crisis point. Perennial budget constraints and a fading commitment to care and protection since the Willowbrook era has degraded their circumstances and put them in danger of abuse and neglect. We hope that the words of, these, of those interviewed for this project and others who will speak today will inspire activism among parents and others who care for individuals who may have limited opportunity to speak out on their own behalf. Before we proceed, let's view a short clip from Geraldo Rivera's expose, Willowbrook, the last great disgrace. Well, I visited the state institutions for the mentally retarded, and I think yeah, particularly at Willowbrook that we have a situation that borders on uh, a snake pit, and that the children live in filth, uh, that uh, many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously because of lack of attention, lack of, lack of imagination, lack of uh, adequate manpower very little future for the children or for those who are in these institutions. Uh, both need uh, a tremendous overhauling. I'm not saying that those who, who are the attendants there or the ones that run the institution are at fault. I think all of us are at fault. And uh, I think it's just uh, long overdue that something be done about it. It's been more than six years since Robert Kennedy walked out of one of the wards here at Willowbrook and told newsmen of the horror he'd seen inside. He pleaded then for an overhaul of a system that allowed retarded children to live in a snake pit. But that was way back in 1965 and somehow we'd all forgotten. I first heard of this big place with the pretty sounding name because of a call I received from a member of the Willowbrook staff, a Dr. Michael Wilkins. The doctor told me he'd just been fired because he'd been urging parents with children in one of the buildings, building number six, to organize so they could more effectively demand improved conditions for their children. The doctor invited me to see the conditions he was talking about, so unannounced and unexpected by the school administration, we toured building number six. The doctor had warned me that it would be bad. It was horrible. There was one attendant for perhaps 50 severely and profoundly retarded children, children, lying on the floor naked and smeared with their own feces, they were making a pitiful sound, a kind of mournful wail that it's impossible for me to forget. This is what it looked like, this is what it sounded like, but how can I tell you about the way it smelled? It smelled of filth, it smelled of disease, and it smelled of death. We've just seen something that's probably the most horrible thing I've ever seen in my life. Is that typical of ward life? Uh, yes, there are 5,300 patients at Willowbrook, which is the largest institution for the mentally retarded in the world. Uh, the ones that we saw were the most uh, severely and profoundly retarded. There are thousands there like that, uh, not going to school, sitting on the ward all day, not being talked to by anyone only one or two or three people to take care of 70 people on the ward, sharing the same toilet, contracting the same diseases together. 100% uh, of patients at Willowbrook uh, contract hepatitis within six uh, months of being in the institution. Most patients at some time in their life have uh, parasites. The incidence of uh, pneumonias and, uh, is greater than any uh, other group of people that I think exist in this country. Uh, trauma is severe because these patients are left together on a ward, 70 retarded people, uh, basically unattended, uh, fighting for a small scrap of paper on the floor to play with, 
uh, fighting for the attention of the attendants who are overworked, trying to clean them, uh, feed them, clothe them, and if possible, pay a little attention to them and work with them and develop their intelligence. But what in fact happens is that they go downhill. I see this, I show this video every semester to the students in our special education program, and I find it deeply disturbing every time. Now, to begin our presentation, please meet Diane Buglioli, an advocate over her 50-year career in the field of developmental disabilities, co-founder of A Special Place, she is the co-chair of Willowbrook Legacy Committee on the Staten Island Developmental Disabilities Council and sits on the Willowbrook Mile Committee, which is a collaboration project between the council and the college. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Good evening, everyone. The expose was aired some 50 years ago, but renews within me great sadness and anger whenever I see and hear it. As some of you know, I worked at Willowbrook State School from 1969 to 1980. On my, day, on my first day of work, I opened heavy steel doors with this key, Let me try and get in there. with this key, <clears throat> after each door, I became anxious about who was behind such ominous doors. After I opened the fourth door, I found behind that door 40 toddlers. That surreal scene has stayed with me all of my career. It continues to be a focus of mine to ensure that such a dehumanizing system never operates again. In 1980, my colleague Genevieve Benoit and I left Willowbrook and opened a very special place with 30 former residents of Willowbrook who were among our first group of people to receive services in the Staten Island community. We must learn from history, but more importantly, we, we are obligated to ensure that that learning is vitalized into action to ensure true social justice. I'm so proud to have moderated the interviews with the parents from the Willowbrook closure. Today, we are visible as advocates only because we are standing on their shoulders. When we spoke during our interviews, I clearly heard their sense of frustration for what they are experiencing and observing today in our field of care. During these two hours, we will view excerpts from eight hours of interviewing conducted with those parents. They are Diana and Malachi McCourt, parents of Nina, Jerome Isaacs, father of Lowell, and Mary Sullivan, his wife, who worked at Willowbrook, Ida Rios, mother of Anthony, Anne Nearbauer, mother of Stephen, and Willa Mae Goodman, mother of Marguerite. I could spend more time specifying their credentials and achievements as board members, task force leaders, radio show hosts, authors, legal consultants, and government appointed monitors, not to mention a long list of awards as community advocacy leaders. Honestly, the fact that these parents activated their advocacy to close down the largest institution in the world is all one needs to know. We will also hear from doctors Michael Wilkins and William Bronston, who worked at Willowbrook at that moment. They helped to organize these parents into an effective group of activists. Also, some of today's advocates will be heard later in the program. Each section will be introduced by a member of the lecture committee, Chris, myself, Nellie Tornaki and Laura Kennedy. As we proceed through four sections of focused questions, feel free to use the chat during the event to ask questions, but please direct them to Nora Santiago. Due to the size of the event and to prevent inappropriate hacking, those questions will be answered through email after the event. However, we gathered questions from people who have viewed the taping to be able to ask live questions of the panelists. For internet security, only the panel will be on camera. Registrants will be recognized as participants by use of name only. With the format business addressed, let's proceed to program. 
Our first section is comprised of the parents sharing with us their memories of Willowbrook, a powerful experience to have lived. We are thankful for their strength to explain it to us this evening. Well, um, there are so, so many, but I chose one that still to this day, I, can, I am aware of, um, and that was the smell, the smell of Willowbrook. You would just walk in the door of any building, except the administration building, and smell it. Um, my daughter, when I would visit her, smelled of it, and her clothes smelled of it. And even though it wasn't her clothes, it was never her clothes. And I would take her home and put her in a bathtub, but her favorite thing was running water in the bathtub. So um, she would stay there for, for half an hour because she was so happy there. And I would wash and wash her hair and wash her hair. And she still, even after that, I could smell, I could smell Willowbrook on her. And then um, when you go back, it was there again, but just even after I left her, I, 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 that smell just stayed with me. And I'd wake up in the middle of the night and smell that smell. But the other thing was the the din, the sounds that were just all the time just ricocheting off the walls. And um, some of them sort of screaming, some were moaning. And my daughter had a very low moan that she did regularly in a rhythmic uh, sort of compulsive way. But there was, it was a cacophony of sound that you couldn't get away from until you go out into the beautiful green lawn, where there'd be maybe one or two people walking around, you know, the, the, the little bit of people were not walking around, except to get from one building to another building. Mm -hmm. So those are the two quick memories. Of course, the visual memories of seeing the people, um, which is undescribable. But the first time I saw really inside was when uh, Dr. Bronson invited me to his building, which I guess was building seven, where he uh, chose not to medicate the people that live there as much as was this traditional. And this, the chaos there was uh, Dante-like. I mean, it was just, I, I'll never forget it. Um, again, I can't go into it now, it just makes me cry. We would get a ride from a friend who also would go there. Uh, when we would leave, Stephen would run over by a certain window to watch the car go. And I still remember looking back and waving, crying all the way home that I had to leave him there. I was working in Building 6. And um, I have many memories for me. Um, behind the door, there might be one or two attendants, as we call them at the time, with 80 or 90 people. Most of the guys in Building 6 didn't really have any clothes. Clothes would come from the laundry in a big, giant heap, and they would just kind of throw them out. And it was like Ann said about the hats, you know, that people would grab what clothing they could. and try to get it on. Um, the dining room was chaotic in building six. Um, and everybody got one cup of milk. And the first thing that the people who were waiting for their meal did was chug that milk down. That was the only liquids they got other than drinking out of the toilets. So that was a really, really hard thing to watch. Um, People were hungry, and one day uh, a young man grabbed a whole hot dog and shoved it down his throat and started to choke, and he <laughs> ended up dying. The doctor tried to yank it out, but it couldn't come out, and I, I was there when that happened. It was, it was really traumatic. And another thing medically related was I remember one person got a wounded, I'm not sure if it was from the skeleton key or somehow he got a big cut on his head. And we were in the 
I, I was in the medical office with him and the doctor takes out a needle and he's ready to start stitching up this wound. I said, wait, wait, aren't you gonna give him any lidocaine or something? And of course the boy is screaming, you know, he's seeing blood and he's in pain. And the, the doctor said to me, boy, no feel pain. I said, what? No feel pain, why do you think he's screaming? I am not gonna help you. I, I will not help you do the suturing unless you give him some lidocaine or something. And, and you know, this was just like the attitude that this person didn't have the same nervous system as the rest of us, wasn't feeling any pain. I'm thinking, this is a doctor. What are we doing here? Hello. I'm Nelly Turnaki, Special Education Faculty at the College of Staten Island. After watching the intense and painful experiences that these and many other parents lived through, you're probably as emotional as I am. But I'm here to introduce the second section of our event in which the parents talk about how they became advocates. To add to their stories, we have two special guests, two giants in the history of Willowbrook. Dr. William Bronston and Dr. Michael Wilkins, who organized the parents and helped them advocate for their children. That led them to be at war with the administration of Willowbrook, but that didn't stop them. Dr. Bronston eventually became a star witness in the case brought by the parents to improve conditions at the institution, an action that eventually resulted in the closing of Willowbrook. While Dr. Wilkins, whom you saw at the beginning of the expose, when he got fired because he was agitating for change, he contacted his friend, a local WABC TV newsman, Geraldo Rivera, and with a key that he was not asked to hand back, he led Rivera into Willowbrook and documented the conditions. And all this is history. Let's watch two segments of Willowbrook Parent Advocates talking about the doctors. I'm going to answer the question in terms of the advocacy. Okay. I, w I didn't start my own advocacy. Let yeah. me tell you that I was spotted. I was recruited. I was yeah. trained. And I was introduced by someone who I was told was a communist yeah. <laughs> and someone who lived in a commune. And in 1971, I did not know what a commune was. <laughs> and that person was Dr. Bill Bronston. He spotted me, he spotted Diane, he spotted Malachi, he spotted Ida, Ida, Ida he spotted William A. and he recruited us. Right, yeah. He honestly recruited us. He looked for <coughs> advocates. He found advocates. He trained advocates because he was a communist. <laughs> I'm teasing. It was like being in a cell. We were trained, and I was trained to bond with these people. And I have bonded with them. I know them now for 50 years. Yeah. And for 50 years, if you go back to building 76, five of us out of building 76 were named plaintiffs. Now, if you don't find named plaintiffs coming out of one building, but that's the way it was. That's and right. the number of people who became advocates out of that building is amazing in terms of people and named plaintiffs and people who went on in Brooklyn and in Manhattan to do any numbers of things. We were, we did it in a golden age. It's the same thing as 1950 was a golden age for voluntaries suddenly people began looking for each other. That's how I became an advocate. We came from the same building. 
We had the same doctor. We had the same objective. Huh? And I had a radio show, Jerry, too. That That's was right. Yeah. yeah. And the bills of hell. That's what it was. <laughs> Where is thy sting a ling a ling or grave thy victory? Malachi, Malachi, didn't you call that board of directors a bunch of murderers and you almost gave them heart attacks? I did, yeah. They, they said, How dare you? <laughs> yeah. I remember the chair throwing incident at a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Too, too I remember fighting and throat. We had very exciting <laughs> meetings. I must we say. Did, yeah. Yeah. That was. I, am, I remember sitting down <laughs> on Victory Boulevard with Murray Steps, <laughs> and I'm worried about losing my job. Yeah. Yeah, this is going to make the press. And Murray says to me, "Sit down." <laughs> <laughs> we sat down in Victory Boulevard outside of Willowbrook and uh, we refused to move. Yeah. <laughs> and we stopped all the traffic. And you stopped the See? traffic? Yeah. yeah, you went to the Statue of Liberty. Oh, that was oh, the best. <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to take over the Statue of Liberty, but we only had eight people. <laughs> Don't forget to get Goody's piece too. Was it was nine had, with the statue herself. Yeah, well, I, I know that Goody's story about having the young lords sur surround Gouverneur yeah, Hospital. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's, that's, that's an incredible story. And I remember Murray telling me that he went to go visit Goody. Goody was in Gouverneur, and he said it was surrounded by these young lords. He said, "There I am, my." He said, with my Jewish self and my little suit walking in, he said, and I was a little nervous, so I had to call Goody, and Goody had to come down to tell him, he's okay, let him in, he's my friend. <laughs> but, but don't forget that the young lords had two consultants who were doctors. Yeah, one right. Was Wilkins. Wilkins. The other one was uh, Wilkins. Uh, Wilkins. 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 Yeah, they were, After they were at Willowbrook. Yeah. And Geraldo was a young lord. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So we had all these communists and everybody. Okay, all these street yeah. fighters. So if you have goosebumps from these testimonies, you're not alone. Dr. Wilkins and Dr. Bronston, welcome back to the College of Staten Island. Let's hear from Dr. Wilkins first. Hi. Hi, I'm Mike Wilkins. Thanks for having me. Um, like you, I'm uh, a little shaken by, by the video. Uh, I want to thank Dr., uh, my friend, uh, Bernard Carabello, for helping me recall the details of the institution where he grew up until age 20. Mike, your video's uh, not on. Your video's not on, Mike. Okay. Hi. Okay. Sorry about that, folks. I'm sort of like operating on an extemporaneous basis. Um, I'm from Missouri. I also, I uh, took two years out of my internal medicine training to get a job at Willowbrook, and I worked with Dr. Bill Bronston to make change. The institution housed over 5,000 souls. Dr. Bronston and I were widely separated. Initially, we started learning the grind of the place. It became clear that the parents did the most to benefit from organization. On Sunday, parents were authorized to take their kids out of their building from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. They would come to the front door of their kid's building the kid would be brought to the parents dressed in the clothes which the parents had provided for them, not in the gray institutional rags they had to wear in the day room. The parents were never allowed to go into the back where the kids lived. They were told they could not even peek into the day room. Inside the day room on Sundays, kids would cluster by the door hoping for a visit, and some would be looking at the door until at 4 p.m. The parents who visited had their child on furlough for three hours. 
This was a ritual for them. The word ritual is inside the word spiritual. And these Sunday visits had the gravitas, the longing for connection, and the spiritual tone of a ritual. The visitation time was an assertion of family power and a show of resistance to family separation. It was the only time that the institution was open to the outside world. Families were otherwise marginalized. Building six had an outdoor grill. I started having educational meetings serving hot dogs off the grill. Just a few patient, uh, parents came in at the first meeting. Elizabeth Lee gave the first talk describing the role of social workers. The next meeting, we had a teacher, then a speech therapist. Each Sunday, there were more parents at the meetings. They shared a frustration with the official parent organization. They shared anguish over the miserable conditions. Some blamed me, and I told them, please do not shoot the messenger. As soon as we began meeting in a larger room on the grounds, we took the parents into the back room. Some cried. Uh, this all was happening on Sunday, and it went unnoticed at first. The meetings evolved into strategy sessions. The parents' first effort was to protest the budget cut, with, which had begun in March 1970. It had made the situation go from bad to cruel. The parents sponsored a public meeting on Staten Island at which the speaker was the World Health Organization Director for Intellectual Disabilities. We had taken him to some of the buildings. At the public meeting, he emotionally denounced the conditions of Wilbur. He told why residential institutions are inappropriate for the disabled. Around that time, the local newspaper published articles about the conditions and the frustrations. In November, the director of the institution addressed a Sunday meeting of the parent group. He refused to make a public statement and he denied that there was a crisis. The parents angrily told him he was part of the problem and ejected him from the meeting. Liz Lee and I had been at that meeting and soon a memo, memo came from the director's office saying no employee had permission to attend the parent meetings. But we violated the order and some other employee supporters of the parents also attended the next Sunday meeting. Very quickly, Liz and I were fired. The supervisor of Building 6 handed me my pink slip. I was in shock. I packed up my belongings and went home. At home, I noticed that my key was still in my pocket. It could open all the residential buildings of Willowbrook. I slept poorly that night. The, the next day, I called Geraldo, and he agreed to bring a camera and a sound crew. We met at a diner the next morning and drove to Building 6. We entered the back door with my key. The crew filmed for quite a long time. The attendants on duty kept working as we filmed, and one of them smiled at me once. She did not notify her supervisor until we left the building. Everything changed after the footage hit the national news that day. My last memory of Willowbrook was when I was walking with the TV crew by Building 6. One of the boys shouted out, Dr. Wilkins, when are you going to get me out of here? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wilkins. Dr. Brownston? This is a very moving experience. There are 430 of you out, out there watching this meeting, and I, I hope that we will have some impact on you in relationship to what has to happen, because Willowbrook is nothing but a primitive cancer, and it was cut out. But the, the disease still exists, and it's widespread throughout the nation, and hopefully this discussion that we're going to have will lead us to look at the big picture, because without understanding the need for unity and a, the big picture, everybody lives in the suffering and agony of their personal dramas, which is absolutely unacceptable. So what happened with Willowbrook was that we went in there originally to see if we could organize the workers. It was the largest factory for African-American workers in the city of New York at the time. And what happened was that the administration had successfully split the workers between the company union and a nationalist black organization that seemed to be a function of the attorney general's office of the state of New York, neither of which provided safe 
uh, harbor for any of the really serious workers at the institution. And then we were faced with this gigantic budget cut. There were 60 buildings on the campus of this, of this uh, concentration camp. And I was in one of the buildings, moved to a second building after a while because of a problem that I had with the superintendent. I kept going back to him for, for correction of situations like getting proper suture material, like getting uh, necessary materials for, for doing the wound correction and so forth. And, and it was clear that we needed to find a force that had the capacity to be able to challenge the state of New York. The issue was not just Willowbrook. It was the state of New York because there were no community services in the entire state at the time. It was Willowbrook or stay at home. And so the pressure on the population to deal with dependent members of their families, whether they had uh, developmental disabilities or whether they were aging or whatever was horrendous. I mean, it was just enormous. So well, first of all, the problem was understanding what we were working with. And it took time, it took months to see. For example, Geraldo's movie is not a movie of mental retardation. Everything that you saw was directly a function of a concentration camp that are exercising crimes against humanity that are breaking the people inside the buildings. They're not, they're not dealing with, with the problem of having contractures or, or having mental retardation, they're dealing with violent oppression from a violent environment that changes everything. And, and you have to look at what is creating the problem. And, and we had to share with the families one at a time, one at a time through tears, through private meetings in our offices, whatever, in order to show them it didn't have to be this way. It mustn't be this way. And so we called in our allies, uh, Gunnar Dibwad, who Mike mentioned was the World Health Organization consultant, uh, Dr. Richard Koch, my mentor from Children's Hospital, Burton Blatt from Syracuse University. We invited our friends, Bank Neri, the top people in the world to come and tour Willowbrook before the, the situation broke out. And we had this magnificent uh, reporter whose name was Jane Curtin, who was with the Staten Island Advance who somehow or another covered the meetings that we held in the community for community parents who were this tiny nidus of concerned parents who refused to let their children go into Willowbrook. Willowbrook was this gigantic dark planet, like, like something out of Darth Vader, you know, that soaked up all the public money in the, in the, in the county in Staten Island. So the, the, the issue was how in the world we could mobilize a force that understood that they had power, that they had moral obligation, and that they had to somehow rid themselves of the pain of dealing with the savagery that was being imposed upon their kids. At one point after the expose, which really did change everything, we needed to stop the intention of fixing Willowbrook, the obstruction that the, the system wanted to fix the place and what we were concerned about was closing the place entirely. And we needed a force to do that. And so a meeting was organized at a local monastery in, in Staten Island. All the lawyers in the Eastern Seaboard were invited that had been involved in class action lawsuits. They met by themselves. All the parent leaders from the entire state of New York came to that meeting and they met in a separate room and all of the academics, the radical progressive academics in special education met separately. Each was assigned to come up with a comprehensive plan to change the institution. And within 10 days after that meeting, the class action lawsuit was filed in federal court against the governor and the state of New York for crimes against humanity, for violations of the constitution. That mobilization, that theater of action was what brought the parents together. Even though there were many different factions, the lawsuit was the critical spear that we needed in order to unite the parent movement to understand that everybody was under the same umbrella of oppression and abuse from the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy did everything it could for 20 years to stop the action, notwithstanding that the court found them guilty of these crimes and moved the campaign to shut down the institution. 
So the institution leadership understood that if they could get rid of Ida Rios, if they could get rid of Diane McCord, if they could get rid of, of, of Jerry Isaacs and put them into other boroughs with their kids in other institutions, that they could somehow break up this block of opposition to their crimes. And, and they were fairly successful because what's happened is as the institution got smaller and as there was dispersal of the families, the unity of the organization became more and more difficult and people had to deal with problems in their local areas, which was exactly what the administration wanted to do. There is an answer, a comprehensive answer to this cancer in our society. And hopefully we'll get to talk about that. But the thing that was most important was that the heroism and the, and the diligence and, and, the, and the, 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 the commitment of these families was unbelievable. And the friendship and love that we shared was equally unbelievable. We, we ate together, we met together, we, we cried together, we organized together. And the, the courage of, of the parents and the work that they did publicly in the open in order to tackle the state of New York was really extraordinary. So uh, the, 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 the issue here is finding a common vision of what will solve this horrendous problem of concentration, of, of segregation, of discrimination, of violence against the largest piece of the population, which are people with special needs, people who are different, are automatically in a very, very dangerous place right. in society. So I, I, I don't have that much time, but you know, we'll get in the conversation soon and, and get Thank some you. of the real answers here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bronston. Such sobering testimony. We're continuing now with more conversation of how the parents became activists. And then when I went into the building, they did not have a bracelet for the kid. They had written on their arm their name. So it reminded me of what I've heard about the Holocaust mm -hmm. and about slavery with black people. So I felt that they would not do it to the kids and I would not permit them to do it. And I said to myself, I would rather die fighting than to die not trying. So we all, you know, have this thing about our kids. Our kids may have different degrees of mental retardation, but they're all our kids. And we need, they need us. We say now they don't have a voice. They do have a voice. It's our voice, but it's our voice who is silent, not theirs. So I always felt they believe that we have a right to fight for those who are less fortunate. God put us here for a reason. He did not put us here to be silent. He put us here to continue on fighting and speaking out on all of the kids, regardless of who they are. Because of a broken heart, my heart, but the heart was still beating. And I became involved because a number of times when we would go to visit uh, Stephen in building 19, that first building, and uh, we have a lot of other children, so we would take one or two of them with us, uh, being given a ride because we did not have a car to get the, the do the trip out to Willowbrook at the time, and we would go on public transportation, which took two hours. And, uh, but those two hours were mixed with joy and sorrow when we saw what we saw, which I insisted on looking behind those closed doors that were locked. So I had to decide I can't take them back home, not now, but I'm going to have to do something to change things and bring them back. And the Benevolent Society had a man that I kept hearing his name, Tony Pinto. And I called Tony Pinto. And from that time on, Tony would call me and give me different information. 
And so I became, at that point, um, an advocate by telephone, by going out there occasionally unannounced, and getting a lot of information that only made me more resolute to keep going. And I kept going, and thank God I'm still going. When I put my son in the institution, I put him in because they kept throwing him out of the school program. So I was looking for a, a program for him. And the only place I could put him with was Willowbrook. I thought they would be the professionals and know how to handle my yeah. son. But they also threw him out. And you know what? That made me very angry. And I went up to them. I said, you're supposed to be the professionals in the field because the Board of Education in the city did not really have the, the right professional people at that time, you know, uh, to deal with our special needs, right? And they did take him back because I went up there and I fought. Another thing that, um, something else that really was very encouraging, everyone, our people, my people here know, uh, Bill Bronson's uh, uncle, I think he was. I can't remember his name right now. But I remember him saying, uh, if we all get together and join the benevolent society, we will be a big group. And we could put out that board of directors who sat around and didn't do anything for the kids. And they were really uh, the director's friends. You can't be their friends, you know. You could be okay, but you can't be that friendly and let the people live how they were living, you know. Mm -hmm. So what we did, we followed his advice. We all joined the organization and we became the majority. And thank God for that because then we made our demands. Now, um, I I never thought I would be an advocate. That, that never crossed my mind I knew I was going to be an advocate. I was just an angry parent that I joined a few other angry parents about, you know, to fight for the conditions. So, I asked him three times. So, that's the day that I decided that I had to fight for March. And later on, I knew that I had to fight for others. Like Mother Snaps always said, when you fight for, first you fight for your own, and then you fight for others. And that has always been my role, to fight for those who are like Margaret Goodman, which is all of the kids of Margaret Goodman. Oh, After I uh, choking him, <laughs> uh, three big black women had to pull me off of him. <laughs> and um, when I came to my sis, my sisters, I told them that from this day forward, I will be your queen, but you will never be my king. And he was going to walk, come and ask me about the kids. I leave no man to make a decision for those who cannot speak for themselves. So um, I used my little four, four letter words and five letter words and. And then from that day, I went home and I afro my hair and put on my hair because I became a part of the Young Lords and the Black Panther. And one of the other ones was uh, when we would go to visit, I would bake for just a huge box of cookies. And, uh, you know, the matron would have the key to open the door to the day room and usually, you know, he would be ready. And uh, they would open the door and they would shout, Near Bauer, and of course he would, would come over, and all the other kids would come to the door. And one little boy came oh a few times. And I recognized his face, and he'd say, "Are you my mama? Are you my mama?" And I'd say, "No, I'm not your mama. Your mama can't come today," and he would just walk away. But the CAC kept me in that line because of that little boy that said, are you my mama? <laughs> he had no mama. Diane? Thank you. Um, you know, it is extraordinary to me that this unique and powerful group of people came together at that moment in time, right? 
to bond and create such dynamic changes. It's really amazing. We are all hopeful that the seeds for such passionate actions will be nurtured today within the bounds of this lecture. It certainly is needed since the care educational system for people with developmental disabilities over the last decade has seen the remo removal of $2.5 billion in funding. Aside from that sustained loss in funding, there has been a concerning return to a lack of true transparency and sharing of a common mission with government. There is reduction in services, service availability in all aspects, clinical, programmatic, educational, and residential. Staffing is at a critical low as our field has been reduced to minimum hourly wages for tasks ironically now seen as essential during the pandemic. We have always known our field provides essential services. When moral decisions are solely based on a ledger sheet, people's lives are threatened and certainly damaged. Unfortunately, today we can see the markers in the disability field that permits people to not be protected from harm and refuses to give them the tools to thrive and experience life. Sadly, we know better. <clears throat> For those of us who experienced the low of Willowbrook, the heights of building a new service delivery system, and then the dismantling of those services, we can only observe with anguish that the government has placed our care system in hospice. Our system is being allowed to die. In this section, the parents share with us their observations about today's environment for people with developmental disabilities. And they share with us what has kept that passionate advocacy fire in each of their bellies ever fueled and vigilant. You know, Willowbrook was a great equalizer. All of us, uh, we became advocates for everybody because we were all equal. We weren't getting anything more than anybody else. And so we had to fight for everybody, not just for our own children. A lot of people would not buy it or understand what I think and what I do and what I will say now. I have kept the fire going and thank God I've been healthy enough to do it all these years. But that fire has been going because I have a crucifix in my pocketbook and I look at the suffering Christ. And then I look at some of our people. And then I look at the joyous Christ in another way. And I see the joy in some of their faces. And I think they're just like anyone else. So why shouldn't they be treated just a little better because yeah. they can't go the whole way by themselves. Yeah. I, because of that, I've joined uh, incident review committees over all these years and I attend them and I, I speak out. I've spoken to the younger parents at WARC at some different meetings, explaining to them what used to be, what is now, what could be, but unless they become involved, it won't be. And they will go back to the medical model and the developmental model will be gone forever. Right. I find joy in doing what I can do. Every one of them, one, every one of our people, they can laugh they can cry. How different is that from you and I? And so why shouldn't they be treated better? That's what keeps the fire in my belly going. Of course, besides the love of the special love in a way of Stephen, which is a little bit of a different type of love from all my other kids, adults, not kids. Yeah. So yeah. I've joined I stayed on the Willowbrook Task Force. I'm still on it. I've been very involved from day to day in the CAB. For those people who don't have a soul in the room, 
that's been a great thing because we've not only helped them, but the word gets out to other parents and it's helped their children that uh, some things can be done, not everything, but the quality of life that he did have in the past, it, it's waning. It's waning because of the funding. Well, it used to happen at Willowbrook, parents were so afraid of saying anything because of what, what was going to happen to uh, our, our relative, our child or stepchild or whoever. There was that fear was in tune. If you do this, we kick the shit out of her, we will do something to your relatives. There was all that kind of thing. Retaliation. The first thing is fear, and so we have to say, they, there are more of us than there are of them. And we will not be afraid. We will define what we want and we will keep moving. And although I am 89 now, but we're still getting the, it gives me, uh, I, 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 yes, I have the fire because I love Diana. I love Nina. We have other children, but the whole thing is that we have to be motivated by love, mm -hmm. by concern, by the gifts of laughter, the gifts of song, the right to be ourselves. And we will then impress, make sure that Nina's and Anthony's and uh, are all taken care of in that way. So what we need to do now is to uh, get a center, some place where we can touch each other, speak to each other, embrace each other, mourn when it's necessary. We will mourn too because there are losses, there are uh, uh, there's tragedies, there's illness, all kinds of things. But we have overcome so much over the years uh, that it's not necessary. We will not shrink from what we have to do now. I think we need new ways for parents to communicate with each other, not just in a group home or even a cluster of group homes. Right. But in general, we had what 5,500 families connected to each other through Willowbrook mm -hmm. that we had a center to organize in. Mm -hmm. And I think families now need, because I the, the house I'm in, or the place Nina's in, one parent doesn't exist and there's another parent. So that's not, not many for me to, <laughs> to work with. So we need other centers other places, other ways, maybe online, that parents can get together and explain to each other what's going on or tell each other what's going on or even organize online. You know, I mean, I think it's going to get very serious and we're going to need something like that. We could have done that years ago, Diana, with the Bronx and the Willowbrook parents and the Brooklyn parents and the Queens parents. I think we missed that. We we didn't. But we had groups, but the, but it was but they were too hard to keep it going. Yeah, you know, like, and everyone was on his own. They well, they it, it sort of dispersed because people yes. went yeah. into different places. Yeah, not only in different Europe, but to different homes and different uh, right. Mm -hmm. So, but I think I think we could. There would be ways of us coming together. Um, online I and mean, everybody's getting good at it yes well i think really uh, we have to figure out some way of, of uh, having a more united voice because the, the highly function autistic people's parents and the parents like i am of somebody that very limited functioning uh, they're like in two different worlds you know yeah, and we yeah. have a lot in common to fight for especially Absolutely. It's not the virus that is, the virus is bad, of, of course, but we were going bad long before the virus. OPWDD has never had a plan for the virus for parents to visit their individuals. But why? It's because we as parents are not together. They wouldn't make these plans and rules and regulations if they looked out and saw a group of us out there protesting, like the kids are fighting about the, uh, about the cops beating, beating our black uh, men and black life matters, black life matters. We gotta remember, our children matters. 
But until they see us out there, they gonna do whatever they wanna do and whenever they wanna do it. We have got to, I know we're all up in age, but let's see how we can reach out to those who are younger and tell them our story. Cause we all have a story. And but what we have done, we have let them control our children. We have no rights. The children don't have no rights. And they're telling you that you cannot come. Why? What kind of plan do you have? They do not have a plan. They never had a plan. And they would never will get a plan. So what do we do? We blame the governor. We blame the commissioner amongst ourselves. A long time ago, Diane, we would be out there. We are not out there. So where is, where is the voice for those that we fought for? We fought for them to get services. We fought for them to go in the community. Did we fight for you to take three kids out at a time up the block and you put it on and went to, on a trip? No. We did not fight for that. We fought for our children have a right, civil right, a constitutional right. And I've always said to my to my to God, give me the will to keep speaking out on behalf of those who are less fortunate. Margaret said to me in her eyes, I don't need you. The other kids need you who do not have parents to visit. How many kids do we have there that don't have no visitors? Most of them. At 119, we got 20 some kids. I think maybe five parents come. But did, did we talk to one another? No. Do we ask, how do we get what we got? No. I always thought that children had a right to enjoy life. You know, after Willowbrook, all the services started to become available many of the services. So I found, and many, someone else could agree with me, that the younger parents had the services around the city to go to and reach out for them. And I think they didn't have the same um, uh, desire or strength that we had when we started advocating and fighting for our rights, for the rights, you know? Yeah. We found that they were more lax. They, they took a lot of stuff for granted, a lot of services for granted, something that we didn't really well, take for granted. So I think there was an era where people were more uh, satisfied with what they were getting because uh, things had changed a lot. But uh, throughout the years, if you, don't, if you don't remain vigilant, things go right back to what they were. Yeah. And uh, of course, I try to advise advise uh, people now, you know, as to what they should be getting. Like we have all these group homes in the Bronx, and we hold our meetings, and we we're always watching out for for what's happening, and we let them know. Look, you know, we could go right back to Willowbrook, and we're almost there. But yeah. I found there was a long period of time where people were very complacent because things were more available to them. And I think we're going backwards at this time. Mm. And that's my yeah. opinion. Let's talk. Let's plan. Let's structure. Because if we don't have it, we're going to lose out. And we lost, we lost everything that we fought for. If a child need a wheelchair, it takes them six months to fix the wheelchair. If you have a leakage in your house, it takes them no time. They don't fix the leakage. So what have we done? We as parents have got to continue on speaking up. 
and bringing people in. The news media is not going to focus on us because there's no votes amongst our kids. They cannot work. So they figure, but we know why. People need to be inspired, not just faced with the facts. I mean, faced with facts, absolutely. But, you know, the movie, um, Crip Camp, did you? Yes, I saw it. Has inspired so much. It's unbelievable who has watched that movie and who has been inspired by that movie. And it wasn't, they weren't hiding, you know, uh, disabilities. There's some that were extremely disabled in the, in the but the, the civil rights fight that Judy Human made and the rest of them at great, <laughs> great discomfort um, is just something that excites people. It really yeah. excites them. And I think we also need to figure out ways to inspire people to think differently. Um, I know that seeing how people were taking care of people with disabilities in small places in uh, throughout the country and other countries inspired me when I was at Wilbur and made it feel, all feel possible that the most extreme, which was two or three people living in the community together and having a good life, is possible. Right. And, you know, and we need, we need to also remember that people go by inspiration, not just horror. And I have the fear that we're going back, we back to the Willowbrook. The only difference is that we're in group homes in the community. But the children are still in prison. We have to admit the OPWDD and the union to take away our children's rights. And I don't like that at all. And I have the fear. Why are we here tonight? The parents you just heard from said it all. Good evening, my name is Laura Kennedy. My daughter, Julia, with a disability, has taught me and my family how to be her voice, her advocate for her and others. When Julia was born in 1982, the world we walked into was far different than only a few years earlier. Services were in place thanks to the strong efforts of those you just listened to early intervention, special education, family supports through OPWDD, and later the opportunity to, be, to live in a well-supervised residence were made available when needed. It wasn't a perfect system, but families like mine had confidence that supports and services would be available in a timely manner. Families could plan for long-term residential supports with a degree of confidence when the time was right no longer. I serve on the boards of the local, state, and national ARC, organizations started and led by family members who believed back in 1949 that their children with developmental disabilities could learn and grow and be active members of their communities. As Willowbrook closed, the voluntary organizations in New York State, partnering with OPWDD, developed a menu of programs that made New York a model for the nation. These same organizations are now struggling to make ends meet. Some have closed, while waiting lists for residents and day programs grow beyond belief. Sadly, it appears the ignorance, the arrogance, and the indifference of the past has returned. I'm often reminded of the words of Joe Weingold, one of the founding members of the ARC New York and a staunch early advocate. He said, there may be some doubt that we can change our children for the world's sake, but there is no doubt that we can change the world for our children's sake. You have just listened to the parents and advocates who did much to change that world. And you have also heard some of the strong concerns about the environment today and the need for action I'm pleased to introduce 
several strong advocates who have joined us to share their experiences, concern, and insight. All of them have been, at, been involved with numerous advocacy organizations throughout New York State over many years and have a great deal of knowledge and experience which they will share. They are Kathleen Nowak, a Staten Island parent advocate representing the Staten Island DD Council on various local statewide committees and Mary Krasna, a Manhattan mother who, who helped co-found an independent family advocacy organization in New York City. Judy O'Rourke, a longtime ARC New York board member from Western New York, who represents individuals in state operated programs. And Eric Goldberg, a self-advocate who co-chairs the Willowbrook Legacy Committee of the DD Council and a strong advocate for other individuals with disabilities. I now introduce Kathleen Nowak. Good evening, and thank you for inviting me tonight. I am honored to be part of a panel of many highly regarded advocates for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I am the proud mother of Michael, 31 years old. He is why I'm here today. At 12 months old, my son's pediatrician gently suggested I have Michael evaluated for physical therapy by early intervention. I bargained with him and said, can we wait another month? Not all babies are walking at 12 months. Just a couple of weeks later, he had a febrile seizure and ended up in the hospital. A very cold and uncaring neurologist came into Michael's room with a fist full of heavy keys and banged across the, the metal crib, loudly asking this young shell-shocked couple, why isn't this baby an early intervention? And so the advocacy journey began. I won't start 30 years ago, I'll move quickly. I was introduced to the Staten Island Developmental Disabilities Council, also known as the council by a family friend when Michael was four. And thank goodness for that. After attending my first meeting, I, I don't know what was in me, but I was hooked. It was a new world. The acronyms were crazy, they're still crazy. Parent volunteers could be part of a process to, to award government money to fund family support programs, residences, and day programs. What? I had to come back. My involvement with the council helped inspired me to be the advocate I am today. I worked hard to understand as much as possible and was elected as the chairperson of the council in 2002. I participated in many council and OPW initiatives and committees and task force family support, statewide family support, um, uh, advocacy committees, board member for interagency council on developmental disabilities, and all these connections along with the most important listening to other family members and family advocacy groups have given me information and helped me know that I'm not alone. Things started changing about, I, I can't remember, I think it was 13 or 14 years ago, and residential development came to a halt. And, and I, I, along with another family, had proposals in that were ripped off the table. And it went nowhere, but somewhere in 2012, we were able to open this home. And Michael was now at a place where I chose to have the agency care for him. He knows it's his home. He knows we didn't abandon him. We helped him with the transition. And you would think at this point we could breathe. Well, not exactly. Direct support professional turnover rate is at an all time high. I have constant worry about not having enough staff in the house. Yesterday I came across a letter that I wrote to the SI Staten Island Disabilities Council membership while I was chair. And it was about advocating for higher pay for direct care professionals. It could have been written today just put today's date on that letter. Nothing seems to change, 17 years. Year after year, we go to the governor and the legislature and beg, plead for higher wages. And yes, they did answer the call with the Be Fair to Direct Care campaign, but it's not enough. We're gonna end up with many Willowbrooks in the homes. If not enough staff, then my son and others cannot go out because of health and safety reasons. Person-centeredness, and choice are gonna be gone. We hope for proper and safe custodial care, but who knows? 
and forget about engagement. If you're short on staff, there's no time for socialization, entertainment, and even conversations in the house. Mm -hmm. I'm also worried, well, actually very angry, about OPW's surprise waiver amendment noted last May for cuts to vacancy and therapeutic leave. It was callous and uncaring. Mm -hmm. In the middle of a pandemic, did OPW ever think that the ever think the position they're putting families in? It's awful. Parents should not feel guilty about taking their child home for a weekend or vacation or send them to camp. They're going to end up being prisoners in their own home. And what's the outcome that OP is, hope, is hoping for with the vacant beds that cannot be filled? Will agencies be forced to close and merge residences? Our loved ones will be treated like things and not people. Ripping people from their homes that they've known forever, choice will be gone. I'm considered one of the lucky ones, Michael Secure. He has a place in his forever home. Now I have to worry that it doesn't happen to him, that he doesn't get pulled from his home. As more agencies are forced to combine and merge homes, guess what? The residential wait list grows. I'm exasperated for over 10 years, cut after cut, as Diane had mentioned earlier. No collaborating with OPWDD, staff shortages, homes closing, growing residential waiting lists. It's always a fight. When does society see these cuts for what they are? Discrimination against people with developmental disabilities. We're in a crisis now. We keep saying we're in a crisis now, but we are really have to act. Willie Mae, Diana, Malachi, Ida, and Jerry and Mary, you're beyond amazing. It was hard to follow after you guys. My son and others have been able to live better lives because of your fierce continuing advocacy. And thank you so much. We owe it to you to carry on with that fire in our bellies. This evening's symposium needs to be a call to action. We cannot have another wall Brook. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Wow. Our next advocate speaker is Mary Krasner. Welcome, Mary. Muted. Hi, yes, I am muted. Hi, I'm Mary Krasner. I'm the mother of a young man with disabilities. I've been an advocate for him since birth, but I've gotten much more involved in the last few years because I saw things falling away. Ellie Roofer, another mother, and I started having lunch periodically to discuss the state of the world of disabilities. Ellie had retired and was able to attend Developmental Disabilities Council meetings where she would find out what was going on at OPWDD, in agencies, and government. I couldn't as I was working, but I wasn't alone. Many parents and siblings were unable to attend, but did want to know what was happening. We discussed how there was no central place for parents who were scattered around the city, got services from different agencies, with no way to find out anything, and had no idea of what could be done about it. So we decided to create a citywide advocacy organization to gather information, have meetings, and create a community to reflect the needs of family members, which can be different than the needs of providers sometimes. We created NYC FAIR, New York City Family Advocacy and Information Resource. It doesn't matter the age of the person, the borough, the service provider, the disability. We are advocates for a full spectrum of services, for a full spectrum of need. A few years ago, we joined with similar family groups across the state to form statewide advocacy network, SWAN. We reach from Buffalo to Montauk. We host town halls on a variety of topics throughout the year in the evening when more people could attend. Zoom has allowed us to do things we couldn't do, do before like join with others. We did with five developmental disabilities councils, including Kathy, who you just heard, and members of the statewide network. We produced a new member orientation um, to, to IDD with the 43 new members of the, <clears throat> excuse me, of the state legislature. So we put together a program to introduce them to our family members, their services, and their unmet needs. I'm convinced this was instrumental in supporting our champions in the legislature when the serious negotiations took place. They restored cuts the governor had asked for. 
including a cost of living adjustment, which had not happened in 11 years. We got the increased federal match of 10% on Medicaid spending to stay with the people who generate Medicaid funding. Last year's increase was used by the governor for the general fund, not now. Last May, after some ferocious advocacy, we got the right for parents or staff to go to the hospital for their, with their loved one, which was forbidden during the pandemic. We got them to rescind a 20% withhold on housing subsidies, which threatened self-advocates who depended on that to pay their rent. We are currently advocating to have OPWDD change their plan to cut providers reimbursement when someone goes to visit their family and does not sleep in the residence. This pits families and individuals' needs against the agencies they depend on for services clever on their part to put a wedge between us. Right. This advocacy is going on right now. Next Monday, we have a town hall for parents whose kids are leaving school and entering the world of adult services. And on Thursday, another one to lay out the gains and losses in this year's budget. All are welcome. And thank you very much. Hmm. Thanks so much, Mary. Our next speaker is Judy O'Rourke. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you. I feel very honored to have been invited to address you all. I have served as an advocate for my daughter, Katie, and for other individuals and their families since Katie was born in 1966. During those early years and continuing today, we attempted to secure services that met her needs, which were complicated to say the least by complex seizure disorder and severe behavioral issues. Well, Seneca State School, as it was known then, had a short-term program for behavioral treatment. Katie was admitted into this program, and through this family, through this program, the families developed a very strong bond, speaking out as a group when the administration dismantled the program for financial reasons, demonstrating to me the dynamic of group advocacy. Even when you do not attain your goal, you make yourself known. We need once again, to make ourselves known and let our voices be heard. Over the years, there have been many good changes, but a sense of complacency and fearful apprehension hovers over our heads. Things are going well, but are they? Services are always there when you need them, but will they always be there? That is the question. Will there be enough staff to carry out the simplest of duties or do we return to custodial care? We continually fight year after year for more money to be delegated to people with IDD, cost of living adjustments be increased, Medicaid cuts be reduced, manage care, not take away our individual's medical rights. The list goes on and on. Are we headed towards another crisis? Is it, getting, it is getting more and more difficult to find vacancies for the 5,000 people waiting for residential services. With only 1,500 available beds, some of the, those 1,500 remaining vacant for years, OPWDD is closing homes, not opening them. Volunteers are hard pressed to manage what they have. And yet those 5,000 people are not going anywhere. And I am sure their numbers will increase and the stress on the system will continue. Systemically, I am concerned with OPWDD getting out of the business of providing residential services and how they will accomplish that. At what cost to individuals? There have been no major announcements that this is what OPW is doing, but it seems like the writing is on the wall when DDSOs are told to shrink their footprint. And we need to be the authors of our family's destiny. We need to have significant input and if able, prevent those actions from occurring. There is a pressing need to reconstruct those groups of parent advocates like the Willowbrook parents who networked so effectively and introduced major changes into the system. Right now, families and advocates are scattered all over the state, trying individually to make change. What was once a strongly connected advocacy network that fought for the separation of OMH and OPW has been diminished. We may need to take to the streets again in order to be heard at governmental levels. OPWDD has become the, state, the stepchild of state operations. It is being dismantled. Walls are being put up and communication is almost virtually non-existent. We need to move forward building on our accomplishments, restoring that network of parents and advocates who work so effectively. 
We are stronger together and we need to be unafraid of fighting for and protecting what we have. We all need that fire. I fought for Katie's rights and what I believe she and others are inherently entitled to. I do not want to see little mini Willowbrooks all over the state. We must always remember the past to protect our future. I heard this quote once and I think it is appropriate to what we have all experienced and have been saying tonight. To get through the hardest journey, we need to take only one step at a time, but we must keep stepping. So get those feet moving. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. And now I'm uh, happy to uh, introduce Eric Goldberg, our self-advocate on our committee. Thank you. I am involved as a self-advocate, not only for myself, but for others who cannot speak for themselves. My concern is the con continual cuts the government is making, the government is making to services for the disabled and how these cuts will impact us with people with disabilities, including myself. The goal, my goal is to advocate restoring not only the cuts for this year's budget, but also all the funding taken from us for the last 10 years, because these services are vital to me and thousands of others. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So we now ask, we now ask all of the uh, panelists to unmute themselves, including Dr. Bronston and Dr. Wilkins. Am I on? Can you hear me, Laura? Yes. Uh, yeah. Laura, can I'm you hear? here. Diana. Unmute. Diana and I am unmuted. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> can we see everybody? Can we have the panel put up? Gallery view. Ms. Willamay. Mm -hmm. Wait, 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 wait. Yes, there she is. This is Jerry. Okay. Can we pin everyone? Can we uh, be in a in, where we can all see each other? Mm -hmm. You hear me? Yes. Do you hear me? Yes. 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 You can do that, Laura, by hitting gallery. Yeah. Go up to the top right. right hand of your computer and hit the view, and then hit gallery. I can see everyone now. Okay. Yeah. I think we're all here. Yes. Yes. See Diana, Kathy. Great. Got there it. You go, Kathy and. Uh, okay. Here, uh, here before us, this evening, is history colliding with the present. Okay. The result in action that these two meteoric passionate groups can create is beyond hopeful. I'm hoping that tonight moves us in that direction. Please be aware that we may prompt you to be mindful of time limitations and we will signal when there are five minutes left for discussion. When you want to, we're gonna ask some questions now for the panel. And when you want to respond, you can just raise your hand because you can, we can visually see you, okay? You don't have to go into chat or raise your hand that way, okay? Okay, our first question uh, is to all of you. Do you see a parallel between the past, which you experienced, and that which is being experienced by today's parents? By either side, either the parents from the Willowbrook closure or the parents from today. Do you see a parallel between the two circumstances or environments? Judy? Yes, I, I see a, a definite uh, parallel, especially in the advocacy area in the terms of networking with parents. As the institutions closed across the state, the parent groups that had existed 
went away. They, they disappeared. There were still parents, but they were so connected to the institution that when the homes in the community opened, those families didn't know, they no longer met. So we have thousands of individuals living in the community who really are not receiving the benefits of any kind of advocacy organization or a parents group. And it's just, I think, a very pressing concern. And, and we've been, you know, trying to address it in a number of ways. Um, maybe with all of this group, we can take a look at what we could do for the future to reunite those parents who haven't had a voice who aren't able to speak up. They don't belong to any networks, but they're still out there. And if it's not a parent, it could be a sibling, it could be any kind of relative. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, you know, this might present an opportunity to reach out to those people. That I think is one parallel. I think there's others, but <laughs> give someone else a chance. Yeah. Um, Bill, Bill, Dr. Bronson. What united the parents in the Willowbrook period was the federal class action lawsuit that essentially defined the class with all 5,600 people. We need, you must mount an equal protection lawsuit that represents all the parents in New York that have suffering individuals and file a suit against the governor in the state of New York for equal protection. That, that will be one potential mechanism to unite all the families in the state of New York around a common vision. Yes. If you don't have a structure within the framework of the law that can build a demand that is visionary and, 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 and powerful and humane, then the problem will continue because all that the system has to do is these guys that are getting $100,000 a year or more to just say no to you and to continue to turn the screw on you and your kids so that everybody is in agony. You file a lawsuit and you don't let people get away with not filing that lawsuit for equal protection and you expand the demand of the Willowbrook class to the entire population and add 10 times as much demands in terms of the Olmstead ruling that doesn't exist now, you have a machine for real change. That's one issue. I'll come back again, but I'd like you to chew on that one. Great. Mary? Well, I, I sort of see it a little bit differently. What I have been watching that I think is terrible is the slow disintegration of certain things, starting with early intervention and then going through special ed preschools and then what's going on in school. That start has been taken away from too many families and that hurts them terribly hugely and it costs more money in the long run which i've said before i think it's unbelievably stupid there's also the issue of um the, our governor just to be right flat out about it but underpinning a lot of what's happened is the fact that they never and they won't pay the people who work in the field properly and we we don't have enough staff <clears throat> services are only, are really about the people who do it and they're not paid well enough and they leave all the time and they're and and the minute there aren't aren't enough people you you start to have institutional qualities we heard the commissioner say at the hearing that he's moving away from site-based programs He's going to bring people into the group homes. Well, that makes it a little mini institution, right. only on a smaller scale. Mm -hmm. So this is what e it's being eaten away in these kinds of ways that that actually only money will heal, in my opinion. All yeah. that is inside a class action lawsuit, Mary. You every every single issue that you have can be inserted as a particular demand and a standard inside that lawsuit. Because the issue here is building a mass movement. Building a it's without that mass movement, you can't do anything. And the only tool that you have is either universal piece of legislation to change everything or a piece of, of, of law that you'll file in the courts. The courts or the legislation are the only two avenues to exercise mass power. 
we can talk about what the policy piece is, which is universal Medicare for all single payer health care, which would radically change everything. And I can provide all of you with a model that we're building in California that really is a world class model for single payer that deals with all of the issues that you're talking about. But the lawsuit is the hammer. That's what's going to pull everybody together and be the magnet. Yeah, I, I'd like to say one of the things that you said, Bill, uh, Dr. Carson, is, uh, <laughs> Bill, is uh, there is a plan here. It, it isn't that the state is doesn't have a plan. It has a plan. It's dismantling the system. It's the wrong see, thing. Uh, you know, <laughs> and, and it is exactly the plan. And to see how much we will, are willing to let go. Right. And so... I, you know, I, I really feel the same way. I really think the next thing we need to do is to have some sort of a summit where we come together as a group, all of the advocates, to say exactly what you're saying. The power we need to get is through the court system. We, we can do the battles of fighting the, uh, the, the legislature and, and dealing with the budget cuts, you know. Uh, those, those are just ongoing things. Those are routine things. But to resolve this situation, right, uh, we, need, we need some court action to, to have some bite into what we're doing now. You, you need to remember also, Bill, that we have a class action going on. It has a judge, and the Willowbrook uh, suit is very much alive. However, the state fails time and time again to give us what's in the class action. You know, what it promised us. Diane can tell you as the uh, 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 executive director of an agency, which in the, well, I think still has mainly relative class clients, uh, when she calls up and says to OPWDD, uh, it says so here in the lawsuit, they shut her off. Diane, tell them. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, thank you for the promotion, because I'm a deputy executive director, but I appreciate the promotion. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that, um, Bill, the, we had some transportation that was being cut. And I called up to Albany, and I also called to the city to say that those transportation dollars cannot be cut for the people that are Willowbrook class. And they just did it. They said uh, some of the people, first of all, didn't know what the will of a class were. Other people didn't know about the terms of 620, 621. But they went right ahead and closed the services I mean, that were demanded the judge, within the consent did you judgment. Call the federal court? The federal that court. That I did not do. That, that, that I did that, not do. That's, you don't have to call the enemy. you got to call your friends. you got to <laughs> call the judge that makes the, the, the law. The judge will put them in jail. If they, yeah. if they breach the law. I think so. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think that's a point well taken. And I think perhaps sometimes, you know, we take the steps of the, of the paths most known. And I think we're at that point now. We really have to realize that we have to think outside of the box we've maybe operated in for whatever motivation. And now the time is to say this was a breach of the consent judgment. It's already happened to the individuals that are class members, and we need to stop it and get equal equal justice for the people who were never in the institution. And the stuff that Mary's talking about, about wages, is internal right. to that class action lawsuit. What we're talking about is justice, social justice. But the key here is building a mass movement where there's a point, a sharp point, a spear that will puncture you know, the inflation of that bureaucracy. They have limitless money. They have limitless money. Okay. They're just saying that they don't have the money or that the money isn't due to us or to you. But there has to have a mechanism <clears throat> to expose that, that crime that they're committing. Bill, I, I'd just like to add and piggyback to what you just said, um, building, a, building a system. When you looked at Willowbrook, you went from the bottom up and we built a system. And now we as parents, and, and all of us here have watched growth, and now we're watching retraction. Correct. There is something that is driving the demoralization of our kids. <clears throat> it started, as it was mentioned, 14 years ago. And now, all of a sudden, the funds are drying up, the agencies are struggling, the wages are that used to be above minimum wage when the governor initiated that 
our rates never uh, accommodated that, that rate. But how do we, as parents across the state, we have so many groups now, and I hope the people who have joined us join one of those groups. We will be sending those links to you. How do we now engage the families that are going to be active across the state to examine what these services are like now? Using the courts, using the media, we need to unravel the curtain and look to see where Oz is. Why is OPWDD being diminished of resources? Parents asked for OPWDD, and now they're, they're at a point where they can't manage the services. I think, as it was mentioned, we need a symposium, we need a parent uh, provider driven symposium to look at what are the challenges. Why are we suffering? Why are there waiting lists? Why can't someone get evaluated or a wheelchair fixed? Whether you're a Willowbrook class, whether you're in a state-run house or in a voluntary agency, we, as you said, need to explore litigation. We need to get the academics. <coughs> we need to get the parents together and redesign a system with the talent we do have in this state, but they can't be taking the money away. I don't want to see budget cuts that Mary said we had to work our butts off three months with our legislators who got it back. But why do we even have to have those cuts in January and spend that agent, that energy? We need to spend the energy on making things better, not trying to recoup the cuts. You know, that, that, I think that is Biden hard. is putting in. I, I have a question. I have a comment. I'm, I'm sorry. I. <laughs> I couldn't use my raise my hand feature, so I don't have it on my phone, but I just had a comment on um, um, Merrick, one of the panelists, sorry. Uh, funny when you have phones, it's not like having an iPad or a computer, but anyhow. Um, I think what we need to do is yeah. Yeah. not advertise, but you know, you know, at this at this meeting and others is get the word out to parents that this is a must, you know? You know, a lot of the younger parents say, I have services, I don't have to worry, you know, my child is covered. We have to tell them because it's going to be the younger parents coming in now that are going to experience this as well and who are going to carry it on that your services are going to be cut once you get to the adult age or even younger. We need okay. to make that blunt and clear. Just wanted to add that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Diana, I know that at one point you had indicated that you had wanted to to uh, make, uh, uh, make I a statement. Wanna, I, I, want, I just wanted to, um, Bill said it so well, I feel like yeah. I can't really add to it. But we need, <clears throat> we need uh, to work with big ideas. You know, we need to, in order to change, you have to figure out what it is you really want. And you want not <laughs> only a few people having a nice group of home. And, um, we really have to change we have to change the system altogether. Um, but you need to know what you're asking for. And it can't always be to fix something. It has to be to change and evolve something. <laughs> so um, I think we need to the state. get together and, and those ideas need to be exposed. And the thing that Bill and Mike brought in was people from the outside. People that have done things that were inspiring to us. Right. Lawyers, they brought lawyers in, they brought um, professionals in, and all that made up the the, the content of the, of the law case. <clears throat> it went fast because we were all so, um, it was all so horrible. Um, but I, 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 I think we have to just go for the, Broke. Go for broke. <laughs> Go for broke. <laughs> I, I believe that the single payer health care system, which you have a piece of legislation pending sure. in the state of New York now that has been working closely with the coalition of disability organizations throughout yeah. the state of New York. The contact person is this guy, Henry Moss, that I told you about, and he can connect you to that movement. The people on this call need to be intimately aware of that work and why it's not going forward <laughs> and what would happen if it did go forward. 
and what kind of input you all, the 400 of you on this call, need to put into the content of that demand, which has to do with wages, which has to do with a cultural transformation right. and a new revenue generating paradigm that's not just how much is it going to cost to provide comprehensive non-cost medication to everybody, but a, a public health system that will be a cultural transformation in the society. The issue of the lawsuit gets their attention. Your connection with half a dozen of the most amazing journalists in the, in the, in the country, you've got Ben Weezer of the Times, you've got Joe Shapiro at NPR, you've got Geraldo Rivera at Fox, you've got Jane Curtin, who was in Staten Island Advance, have an event, have an event and bring many people together and say to them, what do you see as journalists for us to do? Yeah. How do we but deal with this her. monstrosity, with this, this bloated, criminal, well-funded monstrosity that's making our lives horrible? They're tyrannizing yeah. our families. Well it's, it's terror. I mean, the, the, the OPW is, is a terrorist organization as it's functioning now. It has to be yeah. called what it's called and bold ideas and bold leadership are critical. You don't want people blah, blah, blahing to you and wasting your time. Yes, exactly. What is incisive, powerful, inspiring action. The wisdom among all of you is overwhelming. I'm sitting here listening, Jesus, what an amazing group of people you are. I mean, amazing group of people. You understand, you feel, you know, you, 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 you know what has to be done. <coughs> Just have to, and don't feel that the, the older people are versus the younger people, but it is true. All of your children need to be activated. All of your, all of your, the siblings of the youngsters who are now aging with special needs need to be mobilized. They need to be armed and they need to be educated that they have to take over the struggle. With now, the, the other organization you talked about, is that? Focused on the physically disabled, or you're uh, talking about single payer? No, the Henry. <laughs> the the coalition. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The coalition is a coalition. Just has to do with disability rights. It has oh, to do the, the world of disability beyond developmental disabilities. Well, we should be connected to that. Absolutely. Yeah. Henry, Moss he can, Henry Moss can help you with that. And I, I sent you that information. Again, I would be glad to send you the 50 page document that we've been building for the last five months for people just to read what the possibilities are of a comprehensive healthcare system that deals with wages, that deals with just transformation, you know, of people that are gonna be losing their jobs because a lot of people are doing bullshit administration work at enormous cost to the healthcare delivery system and how to put social determinants and public health issues into the single payer system. So we're not just talking about medicine being given to people. We're talking about a change in society. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Change this in society. Right. This the is uh, this organizing is work that Mary is doing, the stuff that Laura is doing, the stuff that Anne is doing, the stuff that Kathleen is doing is incredible. It just needs to have theater. There needs to be some great inspiring theater that brings everybody together. Well, based on that very powerful note, um, we, uh, I, I think that we have in our future some more work. I think a summit of some type, and I know we can reach out to Bill and to all of the, the advocates here to, to mount something that we can take this step forward and keep moving now with this, to not just let it be another lecture, but something that ignites people and that we move forward. Because I know right now we, we've drawn to the end of our time and I, I want to bring back to the screen, Chris Hale. Can I just say um, one thing? I'll moderate it. Sure, Mary. Which is in the meantime, before all of this happens, we actually are facing this particular <laughs> vacancy issue May 1st. Okay. So we have some very now things that we really have to do something about in the next two weeks and in mm -hmm. the next few months that we, we are, will continue to concentrate on. Well, we'll put up everyone. Well, I think Chris is going to give some information in the closing remarks, including the resource list, so they keep people Diane, in touch Diane, with you, Mary. Diane, you are all so magnificent. Got several, magnificent. Got several hands up there, Diane, of, yeah. of people who want to come in. So, you know, don't knock them off, otherwise, they're going to be angry. <laughs> <laughs> 
Let me see where your hands are up. Diane, I have one. Could I just I can hear you, Ida. Go ahead. I want to bring up the very important um, thing that must be worked on, and that is the department has to find ways to creatively find ways to recruit a decent workforce. And even if you have to go out of the country to get workers in our hospitals and nursing homes and group homes, they should do something about coming up with ideas to bring in people in to the fill these staff positions. We need it desperately. Okay. Diane. Yes, sir. Diane. Yeah, good evening. Hello. I can hear you. Hi. <laughs> I thought you were going to uh, bypass me. <laughs> no. But anyway. I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand. I'm sorry. I wouldn't, I I wouldn't bypass you ever, Goody. I have, I have some concern and interest. I know, but we don't have time to do. But I am concerned about, uh, well, Willowbrook, the children who are class members do not get no more service than those who are last class. That's right. And mm -hmm. I think everyone deserves service to where their class members are not. But I have a concern that they are not building any more group homes for children who are who are disabled today. They put in children into the environment they have today, they mix them up mm -hmm. and that is not fair. We do not have the uh, the communication with the administrator, that means the local administration, and we do not have the communication with the governor. So since this governor's been it's in, busy feeling our children are not getting the service that we fought for. But I don't think it's fair. Mm -hmm. It's time. You have to mobilize. You can't go to the governor without a million people behind you, and it's time to put a million mm -hmm. people That's behind you. <laughs> You've got the climate change issue. You've got the universal health care issue. You've got a transformation in the national administration. It's time for war. I mean, it's time for war. God damn it. You've got the wisdom. You know it has to be done. You know, get the bat and let's swing it. But let's swing it with large numbers, with a vision, with a bold, loving vision of what will bring people into united action for social justice in this country. It's time now. They're shooting you like they shot Dwayne White, except they do it slowly. You know, but we're, we're also at the point of the barrel of, of the guns of the administration. Thank you. I am looking at what is happening, is happening locally for the group homes and in the environment of the houses where the children live. I understand. My concern is what is going to happen to the individuals who are disabled? They have no place to go. And the parents are up in age and the individuals are up in age. So what are they going to do? I blame us, I blame the governor, and I blame the union. Because we say anything they say is the union. The union does not provide service for the individual. It's OPWDD who does it. There's a guy named Richard Levy who was the lead lawyer for 1199, and I think that if you went to him, he would be very helpful. There are radical activists in New York State that are killers, and then oh, I guess bring them into the soon. There are killers. Bonnie yeah. Cohen is an incredible <clears throat> person that needs to be brought into this discussion. Well, my heart hurts every day that I know that a parent is 90 some years old. And her child is six to five, and yeah. she has no place for that child to go. That's right. I, I get it. I get it. Wait a minute. Wait. We did not walk the street for that. I think. I think we can see that. I think we can see that we have we have a long journey still in front of us, and I'm just hoping that tonight started some other people joining us on this journey, and I'd like to turn it over to thank everyone, but I'd like to turn it over to Chris now. Well, listen, what an exciting conversation. Uh, I just want to um, thank you all.
and uh, say that this concludes our program this evening and we have to continue of course with this discussion and hopefully will lead to important action. We wish to thank all the participants for their contribution. Uh, you have been amazing as we predicted. Also, uh, thank you, uh, those of you who attended. I like these that, so in fact, you have been the most important participants. The purpose of this event has been to inspire those of you who care so deeply about those with disabilities to become activists. As was stated several times by the participants in this event, Willowbrook is history, but it's also Today, the most vulnerable among us are the victims of funding freezes and budget cuts. The next Willowbrook is looming. For governments, budget cuts and forgotten promises will hopefully always be. Martin, you want to light that low? As Willa May Goodman said in one of our interviews, until they see us out there, they're going to do whatever they want. It is up to us to be vigilant and force those in power to remember our fellow citizens with disabilities. On the screen, you will see a list of organizations, and resources that may help you in your activism. You will also receive them in a follow-up email with these resources and a link to a recording of this event. Thank you all again. Good night and good night. <laughs>